There's tired, and then there's exhausted. It's that feeling in your spirit. Like your soul is running as fast as it can to catch the present moment. But it just can't quite get there. It's the commitment to a million things that are supposed to be filling you up. But they're only burning you out. All this more and more gives you less and less. You go and you go and you're constantly connected. But the screens and the scurry turn up empty. This can't be the way. Life can't just be about hurry. All right, well, good morning, DCC. It's so good to see you guys here today, whether you're hanging out in the room or you're at home watching online. Everybody okay? Good. Well, it's so good to see all of you here today. We are in week three of this series called Fight, Hustle, In Hurry. This is a series that I'm praying would help all of us just slow down, refocus, and really reset to make some healthy changes in our lives as we're kicking off a new year. Uh, Two weeks ago, we started this series. If you're new and it's kind of your first time hanging out with us, And we started this series by acknowledging a challenge that a lot of us face in our lives. Maybe you've had this before. We live in a world that is always in a hurry. Do you agree with that? I mean, there are always more things to go to on our calendar. There are always more family functions to attend. There are more travel sports to go to. There are more deliverables that we have at work than has ever happened in the history of the world. And because of that, we run at such a frantic pace, we go so fast, and we're in such a hurry that by the end of it all, we're left weary, tired, exhausted, and wondering what the heck we are going to do to solve this problem in our lives. Thankfully, though, we do have a way out of hurry. There's a solution to this problem that we have, and that solution comes through some words that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew 11, Jesus simply said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What Jesus is doing in this moment is he's offering us an invitation. Hey, if you're tired, if you're exhausted, if you're weary, if you're just behind on your to-do list and you never know how you're going to make this thing happen, come to him. Listen to him. Learn from him and he will give you what you need most in that moment, which is rest for your body, but more importantly, rest for your soul. So in week one, we just made a commitment to just being open to that, okay, accepting Jesus' invitation to come and learn from him, that then put us in a position last week where we could look at the life of Jesus and the practices he implemented in his life to overcome this problem of hurry. And so we started doing that last week. We looked at one of the practices that Jesus implemented, and the first one was this. We said, hey, when life sped up, that's the exact moment that Jesus would slow down. When the demands on his time increased, when the demands on his schedule increased, his time with his heavenly father increased that much more. And because he did that, because he prioritized this daily quiet time with his heavenly father, he was able to stay emotionally healthy. He was able to stay spiritually healthy and he was able to be effective in what God had him there to do. So last week, uh, our big challenge and ask was that you would try that. And I got to brag on you guys, okay? So last week, uh, we actually made a five-day devotional available on our DCC app just for you to try this out. And several of you already have that, but I found out yesterday that 35 people downloaded that and started reading through that plan for the very first time. So you got to give yourself a hand for that, okay? Like you took the step, you were transformed, not just informed, and you wanted to start practicing this. And so I'm happy that you took that step. And if you missed out on it, it's okay. We still love you. You can try it this week as we seek to make that a habit in our lives. Uh, Today, though, we're going to look at another practice that was in the life of Jesus, another thing he did to overcome this problem of hurry in his life, 
And that's this. It's probably the one I struggle with most in this series. So I'm going to be talking to myself more today than any of you. The practice was that Jesus was fully present in every moment. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, I came home from a long day at the office, and my wife and I had dinner. And once we had dinner, we were chilling out in the living room, and she said, hey, I want to talk to you about something. And I'm like, well, okay, great. I'm all ears. I was kind of scrolling through my phone, doing my thing, and I said, yeah, what do you want to talk about? And so she starts talking and starts sharing with me, and I realized that a few minutes go by, and she stopped talking. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I look up, and she is very visibly frustrated with me, okay? And if you're married, you kind of know where I'm going with this already, don't you? Uh, so I look at her, and I say, hey, like, what's wrong? You were talking, you were telling me this story, I was listening, like, what's the big deal? You look very upset. And she looked at me, and she said, okay, if you were listening, then tell me what I said. Yeah, tell me what I just said, right? And then, and have you ever been there before? Is it just me? Make me feel better about myself, please. Thank you. And uh, I look at her, uh, and I start thinking about what she was telling me, and I realized, oh, snap. Like, I was not listening, okay? Like, my mind was in, my body was in the living room, but my mind was elsewhere. I'd completely checked out of the conversation unintentionally, and that led to a pretty uh, interesting conversation after that. Now, uh, what happened in that moment is I wasn't fully present with her. And here's the thing, as I was researching for this series last December, towards the beginning of the month, I realized that this isn't just a struggle that I face in my life. I realized, hey, being fully present with people is also a struggle that all of us face in our lives. And if you don't believe me, in November of 2010, a Harvard scientist by the name of Jason Castro, he found, you ready, that 47% of the time... Your mind is not where your feet are. You ever been there before? So like 47% of you right now, I've already lost you. Like you're just checked out, you're thinking about lunch, you're thinking about other things you got going on today. You're right, 47% of the time, our mind is not where our feet are. In other words, because our minds are elsewhere, we are not fully present with the people who are around us. And we're not fully present with the situations we find ourselves in, in our lives. And so rather than focusing on the task at hand, our mind can drift. And rather than thinking about the people in front of us, we're thinking about what we have next on the to-do list, right? You've been there before? Uh, we're thinking about uh, arguments we had earlier that day, and we're like replaying scenarios in our head. Like, man, I should have said this. That really would have got the jab in on that person, right? Is that just me? You replay scenarios in your head all the time. You're thinking about what you had for lunch and what you could have had for lunch. You're thinking about all kinds of things except for the person or the situation that's right in front of you. We've all been there before. And what we do without even realizing it is it's causing the people around us to feel like we don't care about them, right? It's causing people to feel like we're not listening to them. And most importantly, it causes us to miss out on some amazing opportunities God has in our lives to reach the people and to impact the people around us. But when you look at the life of Jesus, you see a completely different story, right? In fact, one of Jesus' most striking qualities in his life is that no matter what he did or no matter who he was with, he was always, listen, fully present with the people and the situations around him. Uh, he was always aware of what people were going through. He was always mindful of the needs that they had, and he always offered a help to those who needed it. In fact, I want to show you a story from the Bible in Mark chapter 10 that illustrates how Jesus did this. And so I want us to look at what Jesus did, how Jesus did it, then what we can pull out and apply in our lives as we seek to be fully present with the people around us. Let's check this out. This is Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46, and I'll go down to verse 52. It says that they, that would be Jesus and his disciples, came to a city called Jericho. Now, here's the thing. If you're new to the Bible or you don't really know what this place is, 
Um, Jericho was a city that was about 15 miles north of Jerusalem, kind of the hub for where life and ministry took place for Jesus and his disciples. Jericho's kind of had a long history in the life of God's people. Like any old Baptist, remember the song, like Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Yeah, it's that one, right? Uh, thank you for the two of you who got that. Um, going to cut that if I ever preach this message again. Uh, but Jericho had a rich history with God's people. But by, by the time of Jesus' life and ministry, what we see is it was kind of an oasis city. What that meant is uh, in a desert climate, there were springs of water everywhere. There were palm trees everywhere. It was kind of resort style that catered to the upper echelon of society and the elite and the kings and the rulers in that day and age. I tell you that to say this, because Jericho catered to the upper echelon of society, and this was a hot spot destination, Jericho had all kind of homeless people, and they had all kind of beggars and people in need who would line the roadway into that city. And so what you see happen is as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, a guy named Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, like, oh my gosh, it's this Jesus. He began to cry out and he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Hey man, like, don't you know who this is? This is JC, baby. Like, he is on a mission and he ain't got time for you, Okay. Like, why are you talking to him? And you're not worthy. Be silent. Don't talk to him. Don't try to get his attention. And watch what happens. And Jesus stopped. In the midst of the crowd, in the midst of the busyness, and in the midst of everything he had going on, he looks at this man, he listens to this man, he is present with this man, and he is going to offer help to this man. And he said, call him, not like on the iPhone, okay, like, hey, call the dude and tell him to come over here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up, and he came to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Hey, like, I acknowledge you have a need. I acknowledge you're calling out to me. Everyone else is telling you to be quiet, but I'm telling you to speak up because I'm listening. What can I do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith, your trust in me has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and he followed him on the way. Now there's a lot of things that we could kind of chat about in this passage today. There's a lot of directions that we could go. But I believe when we look at this passage, there's one central thing we see that helped Jesus be fully present in this moment. Okay, And I want to share it with you. In this moment, what we see is that Jesus had compassion on people when others were inconvenienced by people. Did you catch that? In fact, time and time again, as you look at Jesus, you see that over and over in story after story and engaging with person after person, he was a guy who had compassion on people. He listened to what they said. He met the needs that they had, and he was present with them for what they were saying. He had compassion on them. In fact, studies will show that if you were to look at the four Gospels and tally up all of Jesus' emotions, you know which one was number one? It shows up the most. And it's not anger. Some of you think Jesus is angry today. Man, he's not. Some people think it's judgmentalism. Some people think it's disgust. Some people think it's sadness. The number one emotion that shows up and is expressed in the life of Jesus is compassion over and over and over again. And that's what he's doing in this moment with this person who's expressing this need to him. And that helped him 
because he saw the needs he had in his life, because he understood his need for a Savior, and because he was there with the person right in front of him, he was able to be fully present with him. And so let me ask you a question that may be a tough question, but my heart is to build you up, not to break you down. In your life right now, which one would you identify more with, with the people you interact with every day? Would you say, hey, I, I, I have compassion for people, I, I listen to people, I'm present with people, I care about people, or would you say, hey, like I'm, I'm inconvenienced by people, okay? Like, I would just rather not deal with them. I would rather get on with whatever it is I have going on. Which one would you identify more with in your life? And so when someone stops you at the gas pump at the end of a long day asking for a few bucks, right? Are you inconvenienced by that person or do you have compassion for that person? And when someone comes up to you expressing challenges in their marriage or challenges in their finances, are you inconvenienced by that person or do you show compassion to that person? When someone is going insanely slow in the Walmart self-checkout line, okay, oh my gosh, like hurry up, please. <laughs> Are you inconvenienced by that person or do you have compassion for that person? When someone drives insanely slow on Highway 23 when you're trying to get in the left lane and get to the office in the morning, right? Do you have compassion on them or are you inconvenienced? by them. Listen, I joke, but one of those is really going to help you eliminate the problem of hurry and be fully present in your life. And the other one is going to harm you and cause you to be in a hurry and not be fully present in your life. When you look at the life of Jesus, he had compassion on people. He wasn't inconvenienced by them, and that helped him be present in a great way. You know what one of the hardest lessons I've learned in my life is when it comes to this right here? I'll tell you anyway. How you respond to an interruption is who you actually are. Do you know that? How you and how I respond to an interruption is who we actually are. And so in moments when we're inconvenienced, in moments when we're frustrated, in moments where we're angry and we snap off at the spouse or snap off at the coworker when they were just asking us a question, right? If we're really honest at the core of who we are, it's because something's off in our heart, right? That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, he said, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes what? What comes out of the mouth, that's what defiles a person. If something is off right here, that is going to be off out there in our interactions with people. We'll be inconvenienced instead of showing compassion. That's why in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the, read this with me, abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Yeah, out of the abundance of the our heart. And so because something's off right here, something is off out there. Because our hearts are disordered, our lives are disordered. Because our hearts are disordered, our relationships are disordered. We're inconvenienced more than we show compassion. We're in a hurry. We're frantic. We're burning the candle at both ends. And because we don't just stop and slow down and really ask, what's going on in here? We miss an opportunity to engage the people God wants us to engage and to reach the people that God wants us to reach. That's why the story of Jesus is so helpful for us because what he models is he had the right heart that came out of his right life that allowed him to be fully present with everyone and everything who was around him. And so what I want to do is this, okay, like we're not beating you down here today, we're building you up, we want to help you. The question then becomes, okay, well like, why does this happen then, right? Like, how do I get to that place in my life where I'm so inconvenient, so inconvenienced, and my heart is in such a messed up place? And so what I want to do is actually want to chat about a few reasons we may struggle with this, 
okay? And then I want to wrap it up today by talking about a couple of things we can do to start overcoming this problem of not being fully present. And so I think the main reason, I mean, who am I, what do I know? But from what I see, I think one of the main reasons we can struggle with being present with people is because we are trapped in our own heads. You ever been there before? And we're trapped in our own heads right here. In fact, if I can be more specific, I think some of us are in a hurry. Some of us are not present with people because we are stuck in the past. How many of you would say you have ever been there before in your life? You've been stuck in the past. Yeah, that's a lot of you. And so how many of you throughout the day find yourself saying things like, uh, well, man, I can't believe I said that earlier today. I can't believe I said that five years ago to that person, right? Like, I wish I could take it back. I wish I could make things right. How did I find myself in that place? And maybe you think of mistakes that you made. Maybe you think of words you could have said. Maybe you think of opportunities that could have been. Maybe you just reminisce about the good old days and how things were so much better back there. We can find ourselves stuck in the past. And what happens if we find ourselves there and don't get out of our head is we are living in the past. We're focused on what could have been and we are not focused on who God wants us to be right now, today, with other people. Does that make sense? That's why Paul in Philippians chapter 3 said this. He said, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. So like, hey, I, I ain't got it all figured out. Um, I don't have everything in place. Like, I'm not perfect. I don't know it all. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And so I want every single one of you to be a mature, growing follower of Jesus. Paul says if we're going to do that, we need to not live in the past. We need to forget the past and strain forward to what lies ahead. Let me just encourage you today, okay? Don't miss out on what God has for you today because you are so worried about what happened to you or you did yesterday. Man, don't live stuck in the past because what that's going to do is that's going to cause you to spin your wheels, be stuck, feel ineffective. And listen, it's only in the present that positive change can happen in your life. And you can't control what happened. You can't change what you did yesterday. But you know what? The great thing is you can change what you do today. You can control what you do today. And if we will recognize that, if we'll step out of that, that's going to put us in a better place to be present with people in our lives. Some of you aren't stuck in the past, but some of you are afraid of the future. How many of you are there before, uh, right now or you've been there before in your life? Yeah, you're afraid of the future. You're stuck in your head and that causes you to not be fully engaged and present with where you're at. And so how many of you guys have ever played the what if game? Let me see your hands. Like, what if this bridge collapses when I'm driving it over <laughs> to work in the morning, right? Like, what if something happens to my family? What if something happens to my kids? What if something happens to my finances? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, right? We've all been there before. We can be honest about that. But what I find happens is if we're so focused on the future, if we're so focused on what could happen instead of what's right in front of us, then we're never fully present in the moment, right? We're never fully present in the moment. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be wise. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be prepared and plan. Those are great biblical godly things. But if we're so obsessed with the what ifs and the hypotheticals and what could happen and how this could go and how this could not go, and uh, we miss what's right in front of us. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for to tomorrow will be anxious for itself. How many of you appreciate that, right? You're like, man, like, I'm anxious and you're telling me there's more anxiety tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. I really appreciate that. But he says, sufficient for the day is its own 
trouble. What Jesus is saying is, hey, don't become obsessed and let your thoughts control your life about the future, but worry about what's right in front of you today. You know, what's amazing about Matthew 6 is if you read that chapter, and if you struggle with the future and the what-if game, maybe you just read that chapter today. If you read it in context, Jesus is actually talking about providing for his followers. He says, hey, um, do not worry about what you will eat. And he says, consider the birds of the air, right? They don't labor, they don't toil, they don't store up all this food in the storehouse. And your heavenly Father provides for them. And he asks a question, how much more valuable are you than birds? He says, hey, don't worry about what you will wear. He says, I clothe the flower of the field, and they don't work or labor or toil or in a hurry. How much more valuable are you than those? And so don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow's anxious enough for itself, but sufficient is the day for its own trouble. Man, if you're worried about the future, know that God is already in the future, that he controls the future, and that he has prepared and made a way for you in the future. And because of that, you can trust him and what you have going on, and that helps you be present. And so it's not being stuck in the past. It's not being afraid of the future, but what it is, and where I want to land the plane today, is this. Here, here's what we do. Here's what we apply. Here's how we're changed. Here's what's going to help you and me start to be fully present with people. We need to surrender the past that you can't change, and we need to trust God with a future that you can't control. I'm going to read that one more time. If we're going to do this, okay, we have to surrender the past that you can't change and trust God with a future that you can't control. And so this may be a crash landing, but that's how I'm going to end this talk, and so I hope you're okay with it. I just want to end by being very practical and asking two questions that I want you to think about for your life as we seek to overcome this together, okay? My questions are this. What in your past do you need to surrender? Like, I want you to think about that. What, what in your past do you need to surrender and just turn over to the Lord? And is it a mistake that you made? Is it some words that you said? Is it a relationship that fell apart? Is it a drug that you took? Is it alcohol that you drank? Is it something else I'm not even saying or thinking about right now? I mean, what are you holding on to that you can surrender to the Lord today? I just sense in a room like this, some of you are holding on to things and beating yourself up over stuff that God has long forgiven you for. And you need to hear that today. Scripture says he cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more. And so if he doesn't remember it, if he doesn't beat you up for it, what is that that you then need to surrender to him and just let go and loosen the grip on? And what is that? For those of you who may not be stuck in the past, but man, you're afraid of the future. Here's my question for you. What in your future do you need to trust God with? Like really, like what do you need to trust him with? Is it with your family and the worries that you have for your family? Is it with your finances and the worries that you have for your finances? Is it in your career or is it something else? What do you need to trust him with? What do you need to remind yourself of that he's gone before you? He's prepared a way for you. He has great plans and purposes for you. And because of that, you can just trust him and say, God, you hold the future. You know the day I would be born and the day that I would die. Help me to trust you for that and live my life fully present with you and people and situations that I'm in within my life. What in your future do you need to surrender control of? Is it your eternity? Let me ask that question. And I believe everyone will spend forever somewhere. Have you made that decision to trust God with your eternity and where you'll spend forever? 
wherever you're at today, I pray that you would surrender your past and that you would trust God with your future. And what I can promise you is this, that is going to start helping you be fully present with the people around you and love and serve and reach the people that God wants you to reach and to not miss those opportunities. So what I want to do is, um, is I want to pray for us because I live in the real world too. And uh, I can just be honest, this is hard. <laughs> Anybody agree with that? Like This is not a cakewalk. We need God's help. We need his power. We need his presence in our life in order to make this possible. And so I just want to pray that God would help us, that he would help you, that he would help me, and that as we take these steps together, we can be more like Jesus in our lives, which is what all of this is about. So I just want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. And I just want to lead us in a time of prayer. Father, I just come before you and um, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how it challenges us and speaks to us in our lives. And Father, we just invite your presence into this moment to speak to us. God, I pray that we would just listen and learn from you in this moment and that we would apply whatever it is you're calling us to do. Some of you are here today and you're stuck in the past. You're thinking about what could have been. You're thinking about mistakes that you made. You're beating yourself up for stuff that God has forgiven you for. And God has you here today so that you can surrender that. If you're here and you have some things in your past, you're just wanting to surrender to God and give over to Him today. Would you raise your hand for me? I just want to know who to pray for. Man, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your boldness and your courage to hand those things over to God. Father, I pray for these people who raise their hands and maybe the people who weren't comfortable raising their hands and they're stuck in the past. God, help them to forget what is behind them and forward to what is ahead of them. Help them to know that you love them, you've died for them, you've forgiven them, you have a great plan for them and you have amazing things that you wanna do in their life. God, help them to let go of that pain today. Help them to let go of those mistakes today. Help them to let go of those words and choices today so they can be present in this moment, right here, right now with you and with other people. If you're here today and you're not stuck in the past, but you're afraid of the future, and would you raise your hand for me? I'd just want to know who to pray for in the room today. Yeah, man, thank you for your honesty. Father, I pray for these people who raised their hands. Thank you for their boldness and their courage. God, help us to trust you. God, you are trustworthy. You've proven yourself over and over and over again. And so, Father, please just help us lean on you and trust in you and depend on you. Father, your word says you go before us. You make a way for us. And you are here with us every step of the way. Father, help us trust our unknown future to an all-knowing God. And help us to just realize that you're in control and we're not, and that's okay. The last group of people I just want to pray for is for those of you who may not be followers of Jesus, you know, as we think about what area of our lives we need to trust our future to God with, and maybe you've never trusted him with your eternity. You've never made that decision to believe in Jesus, to trust that he came, died, and rose again for you, and that if you just believe in him, the Bible says you'll be saved. And if you're here and you're wanting to take that step to believe in Jesus today, to trust him with your eternity, would you raise your hand for me just so I can pray for you as well? Anybody wanting to make that decision? Father, I pray for these people. Thank you that they're wanting to trust you 
with all of eternity. I pray that they would just confess right where they're sitting that they've sinned and fallen short like every one of us have. That Jesus came, died, and rose again for them. And that you're going to start following. They're going to start following you from this point on. Father, thank you for this time we've had in your word today. I just pray that it would transform us, God, not just inform us, so we can be more like Jesus, and so that we can reach and love and serve the people that you want us to love and serve and reach. We ask these things in your name.